welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. My name is Audrey Monkey, and I am your host. For more than three decades, I've been a summer camp director, and I've had the privilege of working with thousands of children, teenagers, young adult counselors, and parents. I really enjoy sharing stories, tips, and ideas to help others who care about young people raise a generation of kind, self-reliant, optimistic kids who become thriving adults. If you're interested in summer camp, parenting, or happiness, you've come to the right place. This episode of the podcast is featuring Maria Horner with her final installment of Jedi Mom Tricks. This is Jedi Mom Tricks Part 3 with Camp Director Maria Horner. All right, I am so excited to welcome Maria Horner back for our Part 3. It's our final episode on Jedi Mom Tricks. We've already covered Jedi Mom Tricks 1 through 8, and today Maria is back on to cover Tricks 9 through 12. Maria, welcome back. Thanks, Audrey. It's good to be here today. So for those who haven't heard your previous episodes, why don't you just introduce yourself and just tell a little bit about your background? Awesome. So my name is Maria Horner. My husband, Tom, and I are the owners and directors of Catalina Island Camps, which is a traditional recreational summer camp on Catalina Island right off the coast of Los Angeles. This will be our 25th summer on the island and uh, my 34th summer at camp, which always sort of blows my mind that it's been that many years. We have one son, Nick, who is 21 and a junior in college at Miami University in Ohio. And these Jedi mom tricks are things that I've come up with um, over the years of both being a camp director and being a parent, uh, taking things that I've learned as a mom and teaching them to my camp counselors who are 19, 20, 21 years old and sort of thrust into the position of parenting in a resident camp setting. Yes. So in our last episode that we recorded, we talked a lot about how our roles as camp directors have really helped us learn a lot. So we're not going to talk about that again today because people will have to go back and listen to our last episode to understand how you learned all of this information that you now train your counselors in with these Jedi mom tricks. So if people want to hear about that, they can go back to our previous episode. But for today, we're just going to launch right into your final Jedi mom tricks that you're sharing. You train your counselors in this each summer. And these are things that we both think parents can really benefit from as well. And they can use with their kids at home. Great. So the the first one that I have today is sort of around the idea of the importance of the words that you choose and being really intentional in how we speak to one another. And I think, well, I always talk about this in terms of as a counselor talking with your kids. I think it's I think it's something we have to do all of the time with everyone we speak with, right? Not just not just kids, but I think specifically with, with children and even more so, in my opinion, with adolescents and teenagers, really the words that you use are, are super important. Um, one of the other things that I do in my life is I have the, the privilege of working with the youth group at our church, and um, I there's a story that I read to them every couple of years and it's called Silver Boxes. And the funny thing about this is I actually first heard about this book because the author was a speaker at an ACA national conference, probably, I mean, I was still working for the Girl Scouts, so it was easily 30 years ago. Her name is Florence Litauer. And the book is about this one verse in Ephesians about, um, it's like, let no corrupt communication come from your mouth or whatever. But she tells the story about doing a children's sermon at a church and getting kids to sort of unpack that scripture. And what they actually finally came up with was the fact that God wants our words to other people to be gifts, like mm-hmm. little silver bo- or little boxes with silver bows on top. Mm-hmm. And what he doesn't want is for our words to be a stack of boxes that then somebody else somebody else's words come over and knock that stack of boxes down. So it's really this beautiful image of our words being a gift. And even though we are a secular camp, we talk in a different way about how our, the words that we use with other people should really be a gift. It should build people up, not knock them down. Mm. So we then as staff will sit around and talk about what kinds of words 
um, what kinds of words build people up and what kinds of words knock people down. And one of the things that always comes up is we realize that for most people, not all, but for most people, when they use those kinds of words that sort of knock people down, it's not intentional. Like they don't set out to be hurtful. It's a heat of the moment sort of thing. So we talk a lot about what are those what are those triggers for each of us individually? Because they're different for everyone, right? Like what what kind of gets me flustered and then potentially saying things that I'm going to regret later? How do I um, how do I acknowledge what those things are, learn what those things are so that I can avoid them in the past so that I can be more intentional about the words that come out of my mouth? And we talk about specific words, but we also talk a lot about tone and delivery, mm-hmm. right? Because we, and we talk about you can say something like, you know, what are you doing? And you can say that in a thousand different ways with a thousand different meanings and a thousand different perceptions, right? So words, just, just the importance of how you use your words. So when you're um, talking to your counselors about that and like as you're telling parents, um, what are some suggestions? Like what are examples? Like that's a good example. Like what are you doing? It could be asked like, hey, what are you up to? Like okay. as an interest question or it could be like, what are you doing? Or what the blank are you doing? Or you know what I mean? It's like, so what are other examples that you share with your counselors as words of words to use or not to use or tones or whatever? So I'm really famous for the phrase, hey, what's going on? Because um, early in my career as, as a camp director, if I saw a staff member or a camper doing something that I didn't think they should be doing, I would walk up to them and immediately I would start telling them what they were doing wrong and why they were doing it and what they needed to be doing. And um, that's not great. And it's even less great when the camper or the staff member comes back and they're, what they're doing, they're doing for a really good reason, right? So you've just mm-hmm. totally knocked their stack of, of blocks down. You've totally demoralized them. And then you feel like poop because they're, what they're doing, what they're doing for a really good reason. So what I train especially my leadership team on, but even the counselors, is if you see something that doesn't look like what should be happening, like two counselors standing together and talking while their kids are running amok, or, you know, a, a camper by themselves, you know, sitting in the middle of a field instead of with their group, instead of going up and saying, hey, why aren't you guys with your kids? You, you need to be with your kid. But if just walking up and saying, hey, what's going on? And letting them tell you what's going on. Um, because chances are, if they're, if they're doing something wrong, they already know it, right? So they're going to self-correct. They, you've seen them. You've seen what they were doing. They've been noticed and acknowledged. And, and asked in a polite and respectful way, not assuming that they're doing anything intentionally wrong. Um, and they have a chance to correct it themselves before you have to then launch into some sort of litany of what they're supposed to be doing. What I like about that, too, is um, I, I taught the love and logic class to this women's group. And really, you need to have some phrases and some things that are just kind of you remember and you memorize to say, um, because in the moment, it's often hard <laughs> to... We don't always use our best people skills. No. And even you and I who have studied this stuff, you know, some things just put us over the edge. So I really like that. So, you know, it's probably, it requires taking a deep breath right? and, hey, what's going on? You know, and just ask. I think that's great. That really is very, I think that's helpful for parents because it gives them something tangible rather than going straight to the knocking down all the boxes. Right, right. And, and assuming that what they're doing, they're doing with great intent to actually piss you off. Because that's the big thing, right? Like we always take things so personally. Like you are doing this to make me angry. Uh, one of the things, I, we were at a conference a couple of weeks ago and I went to a session and one of the speakers was talking about Q-tip. Now she trains her staff in Q-tip every summer, and that stands for quit taking it personally. And I thought that was genius. Like, I'm probably going to be giving my staff those little travel things of Q-tips just to keep on their shelves because we do that, right? Like, this sort of deviates from what we were just talking about, but we do that where a kid or a staff member or somebody we're in a relationship with um, does something, and we're sure that it was done with the intent to harm us when chances are they weren't even thinking about the impact 
when they said that or did that or didn't do what they were supposed to do, whatever. Oh my gosh. I love that. I think I'm going to give all my staff a Q-tip too. I'm going to copy, <laughs> I'm going to copy you and maybe I'll, maybe I'll put one on my desk to remind me or something too. I love that. And it is so true. I always give the example of, um, you know how like I, sometimes women are crazy about our hair. Like we think, Oh, it really doesn't look good right now. And, um, the thing is, is that no one else notices. And it's just like whether, and so when someone else is doing something, they're in their own world, they have their own things going on. We have no idea. Someone cuts us off in our car and they really could have some terrible emotional thing going on. And Mm -hmm. instead we think, you know, oh, what a jerk. They just cut me off. So I think that whole thing is if you can stop taking everything around you personally and victimizing yourself, uh, even when you're a parent and it's your own child, you can really step back and actually help get a better resolution and better, better communication. So I really like that one. Okay. What's next? So the next one, and this is, this is one that drives my poor son crazy all of the time. You know, kids ask a lot of questions and we feel like we're as parents answering this litany of questions and our counselors feel that way too. Like, what are we doing next? What's for dinner tonight? What's evening program? What do I need? You know, constantly asking these questions. And so I teach my staff um, how to answer a question with a question um, and it does, it absolutely drives my son crazy to the point now that he's older, we'll sort of play this game where he'll, he'll ask me a question and I'll answer it with a question and then he'll answer it with another question and we'll see how long we can go before anybody actually answers. And it's not just a, why do you want to know? Because that's an easy enough, you know, an easy enough response But when a kid asks well, you know, why do we have to, oh, here's a good example. So why do we have to take, we don't call it a swim test anymore. We call it the swim evaluation. Nice. <laughs> uh, but all of our kids, you know, it's an American Camp Association accreditation standard that kids do some sort of swim test prior to participating in waterfront activities so that you can evaluate where they are and, and appropriately provide safety um, practices to keep them safe in the water. But kids don't like to do it, especially at our camp, because we're in the ocean and the Pacific Ocean is never really very warm. Why do we have to take the swim test? So instead of just saying, okay, here's why, because we're accredited and it's a standard and we want you to be safe, blah, 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 blah. You know, you can just turn, you know, turn that back around and say, that's a really great question. Why do you think we need like what would be the reason? Why would we why would we want to do this? I don't know. Tell me. Well, I could tell you, but why don't you tell me? You're smart. Like, you're a smart kid. Think about it for a minute. Why do you think we need to do it? So there are all kinds of examples. And during our staff training, we'll talk a little bit about the kinds of questions kids might have and how we might respond to those questions. And sometimes it's with providing information posted in a way that kids know where to get it. So, like, the question of what are we going to do next is always a big one at our camp, right? So our counselors are trained to have their schedules posted in their cabins. And so after the kids have been fully oriented to that at the beginning of the session, um, counselors can then when a kid say, uh, when a kid says, what are we doing this afternoon? Instead of saying, go look at the calendar or, or actually telling them what to do, they would ask the question, what do you remember about um, how we, how we post our calendar in our cabin? And then the kid's like, oh, yeah, we did talk about it. I'm going to go look at it, that kind of thing. But I think we're so we're so likely to just answer kids' questions and not let them figure things out for themselves. I think we do them a disservice when we do that. Oh, my gosh. And this is, I think, fundamentally, especially with all the technology, <laughs> the kids are – they are their, – their go-to thing – is to ask a question and ask what you, what we think they should do or what rather than kind of researching themselves. And we all know as adults, you need that skill of being able to figure things out for yourself. So you're empowering those campers by, by helping them understand, wait, okay, so do you remember how we figure out what the schedule is? Where, where can we find that information? You know, where can we, let's, or even just like, Hey, I'll go look with you. Where, where do you think we can find that and figure that out? Um, mm-hmm. I really like that. That reminds me of another love and logic thing, which is when a kid comes to you with a problem like, I forgot my soccer uniform. I know this one because it's a personal example. You know, I get, <laughs> I, get the, I get the phone call at work and I learn to have a compassionate response, which is, oh, what a bummer. What are you going to do about it? Mm-hmm. Because again, that's, you know, that's, that's my child saying, 
I forgot my uniform. I kind of want you to like drive home, get it, bring it to me, do this, that, and the other. Although he didn't say that because he knows that I wasn't going to do that. But and it was amazing. He said to me, I go, so my first thing, because I had just been doing this love and logic, I said, oh, bummer. What are you going to do? And he said, well, I think I can go to the athletic office and see if they have an extra one. Or I can do this. Or He had just forgotten one part of it because he thought, anyway. And, mm-hmm. um, and then, you know, I showed up an hour later to his game and he had clothes on. So he figured yeah. it out. Thank goodness there's no naked soccer play. There was no, on. yes. Um, but it was just another example of we kind of cripple our kids if we answer every question for them Absolutely. and solve every problem for them then they're not getting the opportunity to learn and to feel that great feeling that you get from figuring something out yourself. And if we'd ever give them the opportunity, they'll never figure that out. So I love, I love that one. And I guess you have to be a little careful that it doesn't come out sarcastic when you ask a question back and you have to, you know, but I I really like that skill. That's really important. Okay. What's next? Or do you have more on that? I just think one of the things we have to remember too, is like with our staff, we're dealing with 19 and 20 year olds who have grown up being those people asking all of the questions. So empowering them and giving them some practice during training with this um, helps minimize the kinds of frustration that they'll get because they're used to being the one doing all of the annoying question asking. (laughs) And then all of a sudden when they're on the receiving end of it, they don't have the tools to deal with it unless you give them to them. And then that can be a real point of frustration for, for young counselors for sure. And, and for young parents as well. Right. Like when your kids first start talking and the first 3000 things out of their mouth, you know, are questions that can be super frustrating. So learning how to deal with that in a in a respectful and loving way is really important. I wonder, too, if this does this minimize the number of questions your counselors ask you and the other leadership staff? Or do you think they learn from this experience that maybe they should start trying to figure things out before asking so many questions? (laughs) That's really interesting. I don't know. I, I'll have to ask. I'll have to ask my directors that. I know we really create a um, we try to create a culture where people do problem solve on their own. We talk about you know during training about the kinds of tools and resources we put out there for people, um, but always with that safety net of if you really don't know, come and ask. Although I will tell you that every single person who's been on my leadership team for a while. If a person, if a staff member comes to them with a problem, the first question that they will ask is, what have you tried so far? Excellent. Excellent. Yep. Yeah, that's so good. So good. All right. Okay, what's next? Okay, so the next one, I actually cannot take credit for this at all. Um, I call this the Kevin Kilgore rule. So Kevin is one of our directors, and he's a boy that I've known since he was 10. He was he was in my youth group as a middle school and high school kid. He came he came to camp as a camper and a silt and a CIT, was a staff member and on our leadership team, and now he's one of our directors. And Kevin is one of the calmest, uh, most even-tempered people I've ever met. He's a triplet, and so I always joke that when your life starts by sharing a womb with two other boys, then sharing space or time or energy with other people is never stressful for you, right? Because, like, you've got some experience. And in the... 16, 17 years that I've known Kevin, um, I've never heard him raise his voice. Never. Um, And one day I I was at camp, we were at camp and I was down on the dive deck, which is where all of our kids get together uh, who are going snorkeling. And so it's kind of chaotic because there'll often be two or three cabin groups down there and they're putting on wetsuits and getting their fins and masks fitted and all of that. And it, you know, it's camp. It's a little bit chaotic. And I was sitting there talking with someone and Kevin was there in another part of the dive deck. And there was a counselor near him who kept shouting over a group of campers to one of their campers who was having a hard time. Our kids wear full wetsuits, which are challenging to put on, right? Like it's like wearing pantyhose that are three sizes too small. And not a lot of 10 year old boys have experienced. (laughs) So I was kind of watching this all unfold. So this counselor shouting to this kid who's having a hard time and the kid can hear that the counselor's maybe talking to them, but isn't really responding. The counselor, you know, keeps shouting two or three times. And then I see Kevin very, you know, calmly get up. He walks over to the kid, sort of kneels down because he's a super tall guy. And says something to the kid. And the next thing you know, the kid's got his wetsuit on. And 
so the point of that whole thing is to illustrate the importance of geography over volume, right? Like if you want to get your point across, don't use the, the power of your voice, use your feet. So move to where the kids are and, or the staff person or whoever the person is that you want to talk to, right? Like get closer to them, make sure that they know that you're talking to them and, and the response is going to be a lot more powerful. Now, the best thing about this story is that when I first started, when I first incorporated it into the session that I do during staff training, um, after Kevin heard me say this, he came up to me afterwards and he's like, you know, Maria, I have absolutely no recollection of that event. And I said, well, that's the beauty of it, right? Is that you do that without even knowing it. It's so much a part of how you interact with people. You don't shout across a room. You don't shout across a table. You get up and move. Like you get, you use your feet instead of your volume. Oh my gosh. That's going to be my quote for this podcast. Use your feet <laughs> instead of your volume. That is so good. I, I can use that in my own home. Yeah. <laughs> I just like, yeah, absolutely. I'm in my office and you know, the kitchen is right around the corner and my kids, this is that we share this office. So in the afternoon, if they're doing homework, they might be in here and they'll shout to me asking me a question and I just want them to come out and, but I do the same to them. So I've taught them to yeah. do that. So we need to use our feet. I'm going to tell everybody yeah. in my family. That, and that's a hard thing in our house because our house is very small and without getting too terribly loud, I can communicate. We can communicate from, you know, three separate rooms pretty easily. But yeah, that, that importance of getting up and moving is, is there for sure. Oh, for sure. I absolutely love that. Okay. Was that our last one or do we have one more? No, we have one more. And this, awesome. is, the one that I, this is the one that I always end this session with when I talk with staff. And it's, I don't know if it's a Jedi mom trick as much as it's just kind of a, sort of a personal philosophy of working with, with kids, especially um, for me in working with teenagers. And that's that I think it's human nature, especially for, for teenagers and young adults to constantly be looking for where that line is, right? Like where's the line of appropriate behavior? So they're constantly walking around looking for where that line is. And most people, when they find where that line is, they don't go running over it, right? Like that's not the normal behavior. What they do instead is they put one foot over the line and then they look back to see who's watching. And I tell my staff that that is our most powerful moment as people who work with kids. Um, that kid will put one foot over the line and they'll look back and if you're not paying attention to them, they're going to put their other foot over the line and start looking for a line that's further out. If they look back and you're looking and you don't do anything, they're going to say, oh, this is an okay line to cross. They're going to put, bring their other foot over and they're going to keep walking. If they look back and you're looking and they see that you see them and you just with a really a subtle shake of your head or somehow communicate to them that's not an okay thing to be doing. They'll bring that foot back over into what's appropriate and then go looking for another line, right? <laughs> it's a constant thing. But we have so much power uh, when we're working with kids to, um, to impact and influence their, their choices. And the biggest power, I think, is subtle. It's not in having long lectures about values and and what's important and, and goals and all of that. It's in those little moments when, when kids, and again, especially teenagers are out searching to kind of create who they are as, as growing individuals, um, just kind of watching, like being present and watching and just really subtly letting them know, no, that's not a line you want to cross. Now, sometimes it is a line you want them to cross, right? Like it's a great thing. They're about to try something new. So you see them step over, you see them, you know, uh, the, the climbing wall is uh, an example that I use all the time. You know, they're convinced they're only going to go halfway up. They get to that point and they look down and you just, you know, you give them a big smile and a thumbs up and that's all they need to keep going, right? It works both ways. But it's that power that we have when kids try something and then turn around to look to see if we're watching. And so we always have to be watching, right? We have to be watching and we have to respond. 
Oh, that's beautiful. And just in terms of you can either be encouraging it if it's a, a risk or a challenge that is something that they probably would be benefit, it would benefit them or discourage it if it's a safety issue or something that you know is going to be unkind to someone else. I love that. That's so good. And you know what's interesting, Maria? I don't know if you realize, but I believe the very first Jedi mom trick from our first episode we did together was just giving a look. Is that mm-hmm. true? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. isn't that interesting that you've tied this together with, at the end, it's also the subtlety of being aware, being with them, and the fact that if you've developed this good relationship with them, they are going to look back at you and and see. They want to see your reaction. They want to. They don't want to disappoint you. So because you have that relationship, they're going to be looking to you. So be there and be aware and be ready to give the thumbs up or the... Maria Horner, look. <laughs> what are you thinking? Yeah, no, it's. It, I think, especially when young, young people are being are learning to be counselors for the first time, or I've even seen this in parents who are still learning how to parent. They think that the, their influence and their power comes in these huge, you know, these huge moments, these really big. We're going to sit down and we're going to have a meaningful conversation about this, or. I'm going to lecture you or, or whatever, but it really isn't. I don't think it's in those subtle little moments that happen all of the time where you really have the opportunity to, to have an impact. Well, this has been terrific. These, um, 12 Jedi mom tricks, and I will put notes, um, I'll put links in the show notes to all the episodes. So if people are just hearing you for the first time, I know they'll want to hear the other two episodes (laughs) (laughs) because this is life changing information. Um, okay. So let's end today. Um, we, we're going to talk about a book that you have found helpful for your staff and that you think is also would be helpful for parents. So what have, what have you been reading that you think you would recommend to parents? So it's really funny you were talking about that um, uh, when somebody cuts you off in the car and how you get all mad, but you don't really know what's going on for that person. Um, So the book uh, that I would kind of connect to that is a book called Crucial Conversations. And I don't remember off the top of my head who wrote it, but it's easy to find online. And in that book, there's an incredible amount of information about how to have challenging conversations with people. But one of the things that they talk about is that when something happens to us, like somebody cuts us off in the car, we make up in our heads their story, right? Like we make up what they're like, they're just trying to, you know, they're trying to make my day horrible. They're you know, coming out to get me, whatever, but we don't know what their story is. And in the absence of that, we create our own. But when we find out somebody else's story, you know, they're rushing to the hospital because their child was injured or, um, you know, whatever reason, then all of a sudden we feel less angry and less stressed out. And so just that reminder that we don't know their story um, helps keep my blood pressure down anyway when stuff like that happens. So that's a great book, Crucial Conversations. I highly recommend it. And I remember something else from that book that's really good is about how everybody, both people need to be in a, in a state of safety to have any kind of right. conversation. And I think when working with kids or parenting or any relationship, that's really key too, that you both need to be calm and feeling safe with each other so that you're not being defensive so that you can both share. So yes, I highly recommend. And the reason you're not remembering the author is because I think there are like five authors on that book okay. and, they're, and they're all listed, but I'll put it on there. Um, and you know what? I just have to say, we have like, one more minute. Um, you know, Brene Brown talks about right, your yeah. story. And when you were talking about that, I was just, I have been able to use that same thing. When you get your feelings hurt, you can say to someone, the story I'm telling myself is that the reason you canceled our lunch is because you don't value our friendship. You know what I mean? Or whatever it is. So it's a really great way to almost like use that I conversation that we've learned. You know how we learned like you shouldn't say, well, you did this and you did that and you, you, you. Instead, you say, you know, I feel sad that this happened or whatever. But I think that story thing really resonates. And I think kids can also really relate to that. So like as a parent, you know, whatever, if you're personalizing something or whatever, just being able to use those words and show your child how to use that too. Like when their feelings are hurt, if they have a friendship issue, they can say to their friend, you know, I, the story I'm telling myself is that, you know, you don't want to play with me because you don't like me. 
And then the friend has the opportunity to say, oh, well, I was doing this other thing with another kid. That was what was going on with me. So I really like that. Anyway, Maria, as always, it has been such a pleasure chatting with you. And we will definitely have to do it again. We'll do another series, perhaps on the topic of something to do with camp, because that's another topic that we can really talk a lot about. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Thanks for being on again. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you for joining me for Jedi Mom Tricks Part 3 with Maria Horner. You can find notes and resources and links on my website at sunshine-parenting.com. I also have a favor to ask. If you are a regular listener and you're enjoying the podcast, I'd love it if you take a few minutes to go and give me a rating and review at iTunes. I'm going to be selecting some people who write reviews for a special parent pack that I'm putting together. So please take a few minutes to do so, and hopefully you'll be one of the winners of my parent pack. I'm going to end today with a quote from the book, Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When Stakes Are High. As you practice presenting this question to yourself at emotional times, you'll discover that at first you resist it. When our brain isn't functioning well, we resist complexity. We adore the ease of simply choosing between attacking or hiding, and the fact that we think it makes us look good. I'm sorry, but I just had to destroy the guy's self-image if I was going to keep my integrity. It wasn't pretty, but it was the right thing to do. Fortunately, when you refuse the fool's choice, When you require your brain to solve the more complex problem, more often than not, it does just that. You'll find there is a way to share your concerns, listen sincerely to those of others, and build the relationship all at the same time. And the results can be life-changing.